What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to a new Mock Draft episode. Today, joined by a pair of very special guests for the second year in a row. We have from the Sumer Sports NFL Draft Show on Sirius XM, Eric Eager, formerly of PFF, was just an integral part of building up pro football focus into what they are today. And one of the just brightest, most forward-thinking, analytical minds in the football world. And then, of course, Thomas Dimitrov, a man for Falcons fans that needs no introduction, former general manager of the Atlanta Falcons, two-time executive of the year award winner. Gentlemen, how are we doing just a week before draft day here? Things are good. I'm I'm excited. Uh, I've been I can't I've been I've been really enjoying listening to Thomas talk about all these prospects uh, and learning so much from him. So it's been great. Marcus, the way you let in on that, I thought you were telling me that I was one of the most intelligent football data minds, and I was thinking, wow, two years in Sumer Sports, and and I've uh, I've turned the corner. But evidently, it is all about Eric. By the way, Eric is one of the most coveted person out there to talk to about football and data. Even people come around our building here in Atlanta and they want to talk to Eric about data, about football. So it's great pairing with him, of course, and great being with I, you I again. Feel like, Thanks for I feel like they just want to yeah. come by to see me like pretend to be a pass rusher and stuff. Like I'm the batting stance guy when it mm -hmm. comes to that. But uh, but yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. They stop in to measure your arm length, see if you could, you know, suit up on Sundays. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Uh, before we did get started, uh, Thomas, I wanted to ask you a question. You know, back when you were sitting in that GM chair in Atlanta and, you know, Mel Kuyper, uh, Daniel Jeremiah drops their latest mock draft. What, is, what does that mean to you as a GM? Is it do you just, you know, brush it aside? Do you just ignore it entirely? Do you just give a five minute read and get a good laugh out of it? Or is there actually something there that uh, NFL teams can take from like the media exercises? So I'll be honest with you. We would always create our mock drafts for Arthur Blank and co. So the football people would look at them and we would monitor them. But really, it would come down to a handful that we really trusted. I won't get into the names because I don't want to um, uh, put down any of those out there that we didn't believe in. But suffice it to say, there were certain mocks that we followed and, and others not. When you were at the top, you know, you would always watch and there would be new information coming about. And we were, we were big about making sure we were collecting the right information, Marcus. We didn't just dismiss it as a media thing at all. We followed it and we understood uh, wisdom of the crowds. We talk about that a lot at Sumer Sports. So the biggest thing is just making sure that you don't get too caught up in it and you make sure that you convince your owner that you are the professionals and not Daniel Jeremiah and, and Mike Mayock, who I love, who is with us now at Sumer Sports. Would it uh, would it be something that might make you like revisit a player ever, or was it more just like, oh, maybe we can wait till the second round for a guy we, you know, maybe we have a fourth or we have a second round grade on a guy, but you know, everybody else seems to think this is a fourth round player. Maybe we can wait a little bit. Would it more impact your po process or the actual evaluation side of things? That's a great question, and and as you're watching the first and second round, there's no question that it would send you back, or I as a general manager would reach out to the area scout in that area or the regional or national scout and have them reassure me that we are in the right spot or go back and reevaluate. And there were times when people would go back and reevaluate with hat in hand, Thomas, you know, I F that up. I literally screwed that up. I did not know I was eating too many bagels when I was at the university of Alabama that day. And I just got caught up in it. So that happens for sure. Cool. All right, well, let's do our own mock draft that is going to obviously change every NFL team's draft boards within this week. Um, so we have a, a mostly down-the-board order. We moved it around a little bit so that if a team has multiple picks, the same person is picking for that team. Um, and that is going to start here with me. Uh, I wanted to take the Bears because there's just not much conversation to be had here with the number one overall pick. Uh, it's going to be Caleb Williams. Uh, you know, I keep saying Bears fans, I think, are going to be pretty happy with their quarterback for the next 10 years. They're just going to have to deal with not getting a whole lot of analysis on their their mock drafts here. Um, so unless either of you have anything you want to add to that, I will pass it to Eric. Uh, and I'm very curious with the commanders here, which quarterback uh, you would be thinking about here. Yeah, this is one um, 
where I might be different than the market. I know that the the markets have Jaden Daniels favored, although they they took some money uh, today on Drake May at Circus Sports. Um, I'm taking Drake May, the, and the reason I'm taking Drake May is I think they're they're pretty close. I think they both have similar warts as far as um, you know pressure to sack ratio. Both kind of have. Uh, you know, some of those, some of those, you know, ups and downs in their college career. We, we saw May on a down last year relative to his, his peak. We saw Daniels on an up, of course. Um, but last season, when we saw the NFL start a lot of quarterbacks, um, I'm going to always tip the scales in favor of a player who's a bigger, more physical player. If I, if I, if there's a tie. And May is that prototypical big physical quarterback, and and I and I think in Washington uh, that that's the player you want to go with. Yeah, I certainly would not argue with that. Viewers of this channel know I I kind of have uh, a tier with Drake May and his own in between Caleb and and kind of the rest of the group personally. So uh, certain certainly agreement here. Uh, we will pass it off to Thomas with the the number three pick, which and and yeah, if you have a, a comment on on who you prefer or whatever, go ahead for for it, Thomas. Well, I would just say um, I didn't know if you guys were even going to ask me about my thought about you know <laughs> Drake May going to uh, Eric as a GM sitting in the seat. I mean, he and I have talked about being GM and assistant GM in the very near future one day, and I'm going to need him telling me all the right information along with the subjective and objective analysis. Um, it's interesting because I thought that Drake May would be a better fit uh, for New England. However, you can't pass up the opportunity as a New England Patriots to take Jaden Daniels. I think it is a win, a huge win, if, if Jaden Daniels is there and I would take Jaden Daniels. I think the combination of, of course, athleticism, of course, ability to throw the ball down the field, his precipitous in incline and how he has been you know, leading over the years and watching the the incremental increases and improvements, I love, and uh, I love the fact that he's as competitive as he is. So, Jaden Daniels, no looking back for me uh, for New England at three. Would you be making that pick with the basically assumption that he's going to be your day one starter, or is that something that kind of bakes into the fact that you have Jacoby Brissett and um, you think you know maybe a little bit more time to develop would be good for him? I'm a, I'm a little bit of a, a let's go now person. And what we did with Matt Ryan, remember, is we, we didn't sit on our hands at all. We went for it, but we were very particular about who we surrounded him with and how our system was. And remember, way back then, Michael Turner was there, really helped Matt Ryan develop you know, fairly quickly. I think what I would do here is continue to build in the draft offensively for New England, make sure they do what they've done in free agency, and really focus on putting the right people around him and ease him in a little bit. But I would start him from day one. Yeah, I, I think it's just very situation dependent personally. And, and when it does come to New England, my opinion is if you are taking him, I do think you almost want to sit him, not necessarily because he needs the development. It's just like I, I'm not a huge fan of that situation right now. I think, um, you know, the O-line, the receivers, you got a new play caller coming in. Uh, just we've seen so many of these top picks fail because of the surrounding situation uh, so that is definitely my fear with the Patriots going quarterback at three but it is also just so hard to argue like you never know when you're going to be in a position to get that guy let's get him in the building and and try to do things the right way so um, well, the only thing that I would say Marcus is I would go back out and try to rehire Dante Scarnecchia and get the right mm -hmm. offensive line expertise even if he's helping out the present O-line coach it is massively important I would take two and three position coaches' salaries, quite honestly. They're not going to want to hear me say this and put it into the O-line coach. It's such a vital spot this, this time around. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, all right, so that puts me back up with the Arizona Cardinals at four. And if things fall this way, it, it really could not be easier. Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, pound for pound, the best player in this draft, in my opinion, well documented. I mean, you you are looking for that number one wide receiver. It's it's arguably the biggest need in Arizona. So you know they're obviously praying the board falls this way. And then number five is going to be back to Eric. Am I okay? So I have a couple things here. So I own eleven with Minnesota. I also own five with the Los Angeles Superchargers. Yes. Um, 
Joe I was going to suggest we do a trade. Yeah. Joe Hortitz, the the new GM, was formerly of the Ravens. <laughs> uh, very trade back. I am going to give the the Chargers eleven and thirty and twenty three, as well as like next year's two. Or they don't have a next year's two. The Vikings, right? The Vikings have next year's three. Correct. So I'm going to have eleven yep. twenty three and next year's three to move up to five. Uh, yep. They are not interested that. in trade. We can force this. Yeah, we can force it. Yep, okay. I think that's my take on this. And and Thomas, maybe you have a comment on if this is realistic, but I have a feeling that these teams kind of have an agreement in place that if their quarterback is there at five, that they already kind of have these trade terms worked out and it'll be a pretty seamless draft day process. Does that sound maybe accurate to you? I mean, it's one of the it's one of the things that we do often as general managers, again, bleed less in times of, of uh, preparing times of peace, bleed less in times of war. That's a good feeling when you're going in, you think you have something. And, and I've had a number of trades over the years where they were pretty well sealed, contingent on how things went, of course. So there's no mm -hmm. doubt in my mind that I think there is something like that in place. Well, you, you, Thomas, you you described that your your time with with uh, trading with Cleveland up for Julio Jones, right? It it you you prepared yourself. It didn't make it any less nerve wracking, right? As you just you've described it numerous times. So uh, it, uh, that that's still one of my favorite stories in NFL history, and obviously it's been fun to hear it from your uh, from your experiences. Um, hopefully, this one works out as well as your Julio Jones trade did. I'm going to take JJ McCarthy uh, with the fifth pick for Minnesota here. Love it. Well I love it. And I, I was just going to say, I love that you are aggressive like that. I can't wait to track your quarterback picks over the next few years, Eric. <laughs> yeah, and definitely a situation. I think you can definitely make a case. Minnesota is, I mean, we talked about needing that, you know, healthy surrounding cast for a young quarterback. I mean, man, you've got, you got coach, O-line receivers, uh, like the number one ranked organization, according to the the players poll, like what a, what a great spot. Um, that you can feel pretty good about giving up those extra picks that this is going to be a hit. Um, so now Thomas is up with number six. So number six, in my mind, again, the Giants and where they are with this offense and how they need to continue to build. They have to believe uh, in Daniel Jones. I mean, they did what they did. They need to give him an opportunity to grow and build and heal. It means continuing to build that offensive line, of course, they need a, a legitimate receiver. And, you know, I'm a huge Malik Neighbors guy. And I, I, I look at him. I love the way that he moves around. We say in the receiver world all the time, it is not necessarily about the burner speed. It's about the ability to separate the route running ability, the preciseness, the body control, the movement, the fluidity of movement, et cetera, et cetera, the ability to adjust to balls. He comes to the table with all of that, highly competitive again. And I think it's a really good pick for them if uh, Malik Neighbors is around, and that's who I'm going with. All right, fantastic. I was I was just looking to see which pick was Julio Jones. Was he six? six? Yeah. yeah. I was going to say The second wide receiver at six is a Thomas Dimitrov, like, number – yeah. <laughs> yep. If anybody's going to gonna know who they're picking there at wide receiver, it would be Thomas Dimitrov, so – Love it. I'm a huge neighbors guy. Um, th I think the gap of him to Marvin is closer than uh, him to Dunze, in my opinion. Um, so sticking with chalk here for my pick here at seven, right? We didn't mess with the order here. Yeah, this is still me at seven. I mean, Joe Alt, this is – if the board plays this way, I think this is as likely as Caleb Williams going number one. Huge need at left tackle. I think the best player left um, in, the, in the draft at this point. Position of value just kind of – uh, kind of a no-brainer there. So unless you guys have any, anything to add, we'll we'll pass it off to Eric at eight. No, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and Callahan, to Thomas's point about offensive line uh, coaches, Callahan is one of, if not the best, going right now. Um, Falcons at eight. Uh, here's a stat for you guys. I know, I know you guys are going to like this one. Um, Michael Hoyt for the Rams last year dropped into coverage 258 times. Bro Byron Young dropped into coverage 138 times um that's a lot uh of the edge players that have uh, of the edge players lie to lot to uh dallas turner and jared verse dallas turner dropped into coverage last year 91 times for alabama 
The other two both dropped into coverage 21 times. Dallas Turner, it has that Will Anderson kind of like Kyle Van Noy, tr- like old school 3-4 edge that can actually play that. that You know, like most 3-4 edges now are just 4-3 defensive ends that stand right. up instead of put their hand in the dirt. But there are defenses like Raheem Morris's that actually still require that player to actually do the thing, which is rush the passer sometimes, drop sometimes, play an actual stack and shed type of play, you know, player at that position. So even though Dallas Turner may not be the best edge player for every team, he's the best edge player for the Atlanta Falcons. So he's going to go eight here to the Falcons. You started with Michael Hoyt. I thought you were going to suggest they take another 295 pound player in Darius Robinson and drop him into coverage 250 times and see how that works. Um, but those are excellent points, Eric. Uh, I think for me, it's it's usually between Dallas Turner and, and Latu, and it's it's really hard to go wrong. Definitely a team that um, could be considering a trade down as well, uh, just because you know if they're if they're close on a couple different defensive players, get some more picks. Um, yeah, but very good pick. Let's go. You know, oh we're, we're been kind of shocked to this. Like you guys don't even want me to comment on the hometown team. Go, go ahead, go Take ahead. Tom. No, Take I can't. Away, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. All I will say out the door here, uh, gentlemen, is how do you go into the future without having a young quarterback in the hopper? And I have thought all along this time that you have to give it legitimate thought about moving up to get one of those legit mm-hmm. quarterbacks mm-hmm. to do the Green Bay thing and have him hang out for a year or two with Kirk Cousins. Love Kirk, don't get me wrong, but we know the longevity is going to be an issue. Just keep that in mind, everyone. But Thomas, Thomas, okay. you, a good point, but you've always been a guy that's talked to me, talked me off the ledge because I am way more tolerant of the midliner, the Bo Nixes and the Michael Penixes of the world than you, because you are very much a, you, you had Tom Brady in New England, you had Matt Ryan in Atlanta, you are like that. That's the kind. So if you're the Falcons, are you advocating to move up? Because Minnesota had to move up past six because New York's going to take J.J. McCarthy, I think, if he gets there. Right. Are if you're the Falcons and all four guys go in the first five picks or what do you do then? Because that's kind of my take. I agree with you. If McCarthy lands at eight, you take him if you're the Falcons. But or or may or one of those top four guys. Are you saying that like. Knicks and Penix are worth the top 10 pick or are you saying that the Falcons should trade back into round one later on in this segment to take the to take the Jordan Mm. Love type player later on no I am absolutely saying that it is totally uh, incumbent upon the Atlanta Falcons respectfully to Raheem and Terry Fontenot that they look strongly at the option and the, the ability to potentially move up for one of the big quarterbacks. I'm not saying they should do it. They need to really look hard at how that will play out. This is a really good draft class. It doesn't come along that often. And I just think they owe it to the organization, which they will. Raheem, I love him. And I think he's going to be very thoughtful of it along with Terry. I just say it's important for them to look at all of the pieces before they make that move and decide to stay there uh, for, for Dallas Turner. Yeah, I, you know, I hadn't actually thought of it until you guys brought it up, but now my wheels are spinning. I, I totally agree with everything you guys are saying. You only get in striking distance so often for quality quarterbacks, so they're right on the fringe there. So, yeah, I mean, definitely something to keep an eye out for to be a little bit of a draft day surprise, but I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, So we'll go to Chicago at 9. I do think if – I am definitely would like to trade down if I'm the Bears. I think they're down to three or four draft picks left. Uh, but if Adunze is there, I mean, it's just such a such an easy pick to just swallow it and put him in the building. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and take him. I, I actually, one of my pro comps on him is Keenan Allen, who's getting up there in age, does have injury issues. So they're going to want to live in 11 personnel most of the time, of course. But you're going to have a, an easy succession plan to, to move on from Keenan in time, too. And, and it's not like the Bears are expecting to win a Super Bowl this year either. So uh, just surrounding the young quarterback with talent. I like that pick. Um, I think he's, I think he's a, a pretty solid. Um, I think, I think he's, 
he's like that middle tier and he's going to help the bears a lot. Very solid. I, I, on a previous show just an hour ago said, I felt like he's, if it's AJ green and it's Julio. And then I feel like Roma Dunes is like a Mike Evans type player. Whereas like a very, that's a very successful draft pick. He may not have the ceiling of an, of a re of a green or a, a Julio, but very good pick for the bears here. I, while Thomas is here, one of my the comp I actually have written in my my draft board is Roddy White. What do you think of that? Um, no, it's a it's a really good thought. Big, strong guy, really aggressive, making big time plays, adjusting as he does. To to Eric's point, and Eric and I always talk about semantics in delivering. If Eric were to be in charge and saying that a Dunsey, a Dunsey was a mid tier, I think you just said mid tier. I'll I'll check you on that only because even though. I know what you're saying here. Even though he's not maybe in line with those other two, he's still a top-notch player, Eric, right in your mind. Yep. He's not. He's one that's going to be a difference maker, and I, I, I like where they're going with it personally. Yep. Um, yep. Okay, so a lot of people are going to go Brock Bowers here, but in my mind, Thomas, this is where I want you to, to throw – flames at me because I know which how you feel about the tight end position but historically drafting tight ends high has not been great um you used a second on Tony Gonzalez a third on Austin Hooper I can't remember when Levine Toilolo was drafted but like the first round tight ends have mostly not lived up to the billing since the new CBA and it's been a long time so I know the Jets are win now. They have not made the playoffs since 2010. That's the longest streak in the NFL. They have not won a division since 2002. I get it. However, DJ Reed is in a contract year. This defense has the potential to be like Legion of Boom type for a long time. If the Jets get out of this year in the playoffs and Joe Douglas and Robert Salah get contract extensions, this defense will be the calling card long after Aaron Rodgers leaves, which means if they can continue to build this defense with premium players at contract with rookie contracts. They could be awesome. So I'm going to take Quinion Mitchell cornerback Toledo with the 10th pick here to pair with sauce Gardner in the, for the, for the jets future here. Thomas well, nasty secondary. <laughs> yeah. I'm, Absolutely I'm nasty. only a little confused because I thought I was logged to take the jets and I was excited to lead in on that, but evidently we were both logged to take the jets. On oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had, Did we screw I up have, the order. Did I? Oh, I did because I'm. I go after market. So set back up. Well, I already Sorry. clicked it. So why don't we just flip that and have Thomas pick for the Chargers? At no, I I love I love the the. We've talked about this before. The only thing I would say is, Dang it, although I, I really love where Quinion Quinion Mitchell is, and I think he's he's going to be a really nice football player. And I know where you are data related, and we talked about it even today about tight ends. However, in today's world, the Real significance, difference makers, the anomalies, the once in a decade type of athlete player at the position. I think people throw away that old school approach, not saying that the data is the old school approach. The idea of never taking a tight end outside the outside of the uh, second round, the idea of O lineman, interior lineman. We've aborted that, uh, quite honestly. They have now as a former GM. And I would just say what he would do for this organization. With a quarterback coming back now and Aaron Rodgers, God willing for them, if he doesn't, if he comes back and things aren't that that great, that they have a young quarterback, we did it again with Matt. We surrounded him with Tony Gonzalez, and I realized at that point, all of my time in New England, to have a top-notch tight end, high percentage shot for a, a younger uh, or a situation that needs a high percentage shot is, is invaluable as far as the building of a football team. So... I want to say that I would have gone Brock Bowers. I don't know if we're changing the the location. Well, you can now. you can you could take him for the same reasoning for Justin Herbert here with eleven, right? Like you can have my my Chargers <laughs> you, you pick here. Could. I I think it's 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 reasonable enough, and I I I could see what Eric was saying. I mean, last year we were like, oh, the Jets are going to get a playmaker. They're going to get everything they can for Aaron Rodgers because this, you know, they're all in for right now. They go ahead and take Will McDonald, who played like 130 snaps for them last year. So it's not crazy for them to think like we're going to we're going to keep building and, and stashing talent for the defense for the future. They addressed offense via free agency. So I don't think it's so crazy because there's going to be Jets fans, certainly that that want offense with that pick. Uh, but I also 
Um, do agree with Thomas that I would I would be looking more Brock Bowers. Um, but let's let's keep it. Let's let's roll with it. Crazy things happen on draft day, like uh, teams forgetting who they're picking for. <laughs> who, who are we staying with? Our, I'm sorry, well, Quinion Thomas, Mitchell. Thomas, oh, Thomas, do you want to take Brock with the Chargers? We can just flip flip a those. No, I don't. I'm, we're going to stay with Quinion Mitchell, and, and even though, um, again, I'm, uh, you know, honestly, as Marcus was just saying, I'm, I just think they need to continue to roll with that offense. It's such a need. As much as I like your idea of pairing, you know me in corners. I love them. So we're there. So Brock is still hanging out there. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Okay. Good. So so do we want Thomas to take the Chargers pick, or do you want me to take the Chargers pick? Um, I, I stepped on Thomas's touchdown call here with you the Jets. Uh, so, so are, you, are you okay making this pick, Thomas? The Chargers. No, I, I really don't prefer to take the 11th pick. I'll okay. Let, let, I'll, I'll take Chargers yeah. pick here. Okay. I will take the Los Angeles player who Thomas. So, okay. Thomas loves this player. We, we just did the, on the uh, Sirius XM NFL draft show on Sumer sports. I am a big fan of chip Kelly. I am a big fan of the type of player chip Kelly brought into UCLA. I thought they were physical. I thought that they were, uh, I thought that I, I thought that they were, they translated the NFL very well at the line of scrimmage. Lie to Latu coming into Los Angeles to basically be a hedge against Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack, their age, their injury history, and just a a, a very big time playmaker for uh, for that that group. Um, I think trading back and getting a premium player at eleven uh, is and and at twenty three obviously uh, is a solid choice. Okay, loading up the edge talent. I'm a big Latu fan. He's he's my number one edge as long as the injury stuff checks out, of course. Uh, so, you know, best player available type of pick there. Uh, position of value over a Brock Bowers, I, I, I get it. And, and betting against those edge players. I think you made some great points. Um, so let's just double check the order to make sure we're all my bad, in line guys. here. Um, you're, you're good. Thomas, you are now up with the Denver Broncos at 12. Um, Denver Broncos at 12, uh, obviously we all know quarterback is the need amongst a number of other things, right? They need to continue to build that roster. You know, when you start talking about, they also need a tight end and Brock Bowers is still out there, even though, even though I love Brock Bowers, as I mentioned, I mean, here we are with a drastic quarterback need. What are we going to do? <laughs> we have to seriously look at Bo Nix. I'm a big Bo Nix fan. I know that he's a couple years older than some of the other uh, quarterbacks out there, and that's some of the concern. But what I like about Bo Nix is when I watched him, he just has a presence about him and a maturity about him and an understanding of the system about him. And he has system to him, of course. He's a strong, tough guy. I mean, that, that guy, watching him run when he has to run and do what he needs to do to make the play, I just – I was – I was very impressed with him in my early watchings of him as well. So that's where I'm going with him. I think they need to solidify some semblance or more than some semblance of a, a quarterback that people can, can believe in. And it's been tough there. As you, we all know that organization, that city, that fan base needs, needs to truly have someone in that spot that they can hold on to and believe into for years to come. And I think this is a really good consideration for him. I'm a big fan of that pick, Thomas. I've been kind of tying these these two together for a long time now. And, yeah, I just think the system with Sean Payton, uh, you know, it's a guy that just he loves to play in structure and play on time. And, and when the coach is giving him good looks, he's going to take it, and then he can create on third down on top of that. Uh, a lot of Broncos fans are averse to this pick uh, just because they see him as a little bit of a lower upside quarterback. Um, I, I don't know, man. I think in that system you are definitely – putting him in a spot where he can be a top, you know, 15 quarterback, some, something like a Brock Purdy, like a Jalen Hurts even. Um, not not with all the rushing ability, but um, as a passer, similar to those guys who have had a lot of success. So uh, I'm a big fan of that pick. I'm now up at 13, I believe. Uh, yes. So similar spot where you need a quarterback. Are you taking it at 13? You're now looking at QB six in this draft with the 13th pick. Is that too rich? I, I also have to beg the question of you take Michael Penix. 
how sure are you that he's going to be a better option for you than Gardner Minshew? Um, you know, I would say with the arm talent, there's certainly upside for him to be better, but within the first couple of years, it's a risk. So I'm actually going to stay away from the quarterback pick here. Maybe as you get down the board, you're starting to think about, you know, making moving up with that 44th pick if that becomes an option for you. But I'm definitely going to just kind of take the value at this point. And, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to go Brock Bowers. They went tight end last year. He would be the best player on the board. I'm actually going to go with a player that I'm very high on that I think is a huge need for them. Amarius Mims, the tackle out of Georgia, an absolute monster in the run game, which they are going to want to run the football. They showed us that last year, um, but they need that right tackle. I think with Mims, he's he's green, but he's not raw. I think his hands and his feet are really good with the exception of kind of identifying those inside counters and really stepping in um, to protect that inside shoulder. But I think with the lack of reps he's had, that's something when the rest of his technique looks so good, that's something you think you can coach up in him. So I'm a big fan of him uh, patching up that old line for the Raiders. Can I say quickly, uh, I 100% agree with you. I think where the mistakes are often made, and I have made them, believe me, when you're over uh, accentuating your needs as a general manager, as a team builder, and yes, they need quarterback. We know that. And yet Michael Penix, although a good football player and a good quarterback, there's just, there are too many things out there that to think about taking him in the top 15 or the top 20 is, is a concern. And it's to me, it could be a forced need getting an O lineman in there. However, I think is a, is a really smart move. Tom Telesco is a smart Football man, I think Tom should honestly consider moving back. There are some other O linemen there potentially give some more value to his his build, and that may be something. But I like where you're going with the idea. Okay, um, now we have Eric back up at 14 for the Saints. Yeah, it's funny because we got two offensive linemen, even though the betting markets say nine and a half is the expected. So we got some work to do. To get the okay, fat guys wow. into this into this group of thirty two <laughs> here, um, and I'm going to start here. Uh, I know um, scouts uh, like I know Thomas likes this guy. I know you know we've talked about him on our series. So um, Saints need him, right? Ryan Ramchek, uh, degenerate as far as his his body is concerned. Like they just don't have a lot of uh, they don't have a lot of depth the, the, the way that they've kind of built their team. Uh, Oli Fashanu, I think, is is who I'm going to take here with the Saints with pick 14. Yeah, it would have been my pick as well. Uh, Thomas, you are up at 15. I am up at 15, and and uh, by the way, I do like that pick, Eric. Nice and way to way to get your big guys in there. I think that's obviously very very important for us. Um, Wow, I'm just I'm a little bit I'm back thinking we did in fact pick Quinion Mitch Quinion Mitchell right because <laughs> I was I was kind of trying to get my head <laughs> sorry. Right. sorry, sorry. I, sorry, you're gonna you're not gonna live it down. I, I get that. Um I look the corner position, uh look, I I know that that's an important spot for them. They have a couple other needs, of course, but to pass up a, a really good corner and and I like Alabama cornerbacks, I like Terry Ter Arnold in this situation. Some people might think it's a little bit of a reach. I mean, he is a very talented person, I think, with a lot of ability that I think comes to the table for a guy like, like Chris Ballard, who loves his defensive backs, right, as a general manager there and the co and, and the and the main team builder there. I think that would be a really nice consideration for him. Well, I don't think it's going to be considered a reach. Uh, Arif Hassan just posted his top 100 big uh, consensus big board, which is like the shared – you know, view from 75 analysts. And I think Arnold was 14 or 15. So I think you're right, right in line with where people expect him to go, certainly position and needs. So it's a very good pick. Um, that puts me back up with Seattle at 16. Uh, I, oh, man, they did resign Noah Fant, which I think is, I kind of like Noah Fant. I think that's just enough to deter me from taking. Best no offense, no Bowers offense. Here. The reason you don't take Brock Bowers here because when you take a guy like Noah Fant at seventeen, he eventually becomes good, but he's not good during his rookie contract. Yeah, yeah, I think Bowers is a little bit more ready to step sure. in than that, but I I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, um, Fant is seemingly just kind of getting getting going now, so 
Um, I don't know why I clicked running back there. I just wanted to give Eric Eager a you, heart you attack. Scared, yeah, you freaked me out there. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of good options here. Interior offensive line is such a just tragic need for them. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry to my viewers to keep making the same picks, but if the board's going to fall to me this way, I'm going to keep keep making what I think is the best pick, and uh, I, apparently they have him listed as a tackle here. Uh, but Graham Barton is one of the 15 to 20 best players in this draft, in my opinion. Just a guy that's really hard to find a weakness on as you get through his tape. He's athletic. He's got play strength. Uh, he's played tackle. He's played center. He's, he's just this awesome, complete prospect. The only thing is he's a guard or a center, right? He, a lot of people aren't going to expect him to play tackle at the next level with his with his frame. But, man, they need a left guard. They need a center. They need a right guard. They can figure out where Graham Barton's playing later. I'm a huge fan of his game, so we're going to stay stay put. And when I've traded down with Seattle in the past, I've missed out on Graham Barton quite a lot in these experiments because you got Pittsburgh and Miami sitting there that I think are, are eyeing the same player. Do you think Mike McDonald wants Kyle Hamilton and he sees Kyle Hamilton and Cooper DeGene? I have actually drawn those comparisons before. I could, I could certainly see it. Um, but they did... They did bring in, um, not that it would deter you from from drafting DeGene, but they did sign the the guy from Jacksonville, right? Um, sorry, I clicked on the Chargers. Um, Jenkins, they signed yeah, him, right? Ray, Rayshon I mean, Jenkins. Yeah. Rayshon Jenkins. Yeah, and they have, I mean, and they have a Devin Witherspoon, who's kind of an inside outside player, which like Kobe I get Bryant that. as well. Kobe, yeah, uh, mama yeah. mentality. Yep. Um, Okay, Jacksonville, speaking of Rayshon Jenkins, um, they have Evan Ingram, another first-round tight end who's better for the second team he's playing for. Um, mm -hmm. This Jacksonville team, defense kind of played really well early on, faded down the stretch. They kind of – they need some – this is where, you know, they brought in Josh Allen. You know, they got Josh Allen a contract extension. They have Trayvon Walker, so they don't really kind of need that player. Um but I do think this is where they can get some value on the interior of the defensive line with Byron Murphy of Texas uh, mm -hmm. to be that interior rusher to go with those two bucks that they have rushing the pass on the edge. So I'm going to go Byron Murphy, defensive interior player, Texas. I, I like it, man. I'm a huge fan of Byron Murphy. They, they did sign Eric Armstead, but they need two guys in the interior. Um, you know, Hamilton's hit or miss on pass rush downs. So I think, yeah. I think you can definitely find a home for him. Uh he would have been the best player on my board outside of Brock Bowers, who I agree they don't need. So a uh, good pick. This puts um, Thomas up at 18. Guys, I, by the way, I do, do love that D line pick. I'm not, I've, I've made some mistakes in the past and we've hit on some in the interior D line. And by the way, very quickly, Marcus, we had a great conversation the other day, Eric and I talking about percentage of play when you're drafting in the first round of the interior D line, as a GM, you want to make sure you are hammering your hammering your D coordinator and your defensive line coach to tell you that they are going to utilize this player more than 31% of the time. Mm. And Eric and I talked about that. That's such an important part. So not to that's to something that my all, my but... Packers not to cut you off. That's something my Packers didn't quite clarify when they took Devonta Wyatt. Um, you know, came around in year two, but year one he only played probably you know 15 20 percent of the snaps was, it was definitely a frustration for a lot of Packers fans. It's, it's a tough thing. And then when you're looking at an owner and a head coach and you're thinking, man, we, we put a lot of uh, sort of, we endorse this and that's a big move. So anyway, the point is utilize him. Hopefully he sacks and does all the good things that Eric wants him to do uh, on top of playing the run. I would, so Cincinnati again, sorry for jumping back on that Cincinnati. Uh, look, I, I know there's want to continue to build around what we think is a fantastic quarterback. Ultimately, if you, you could add a receiver, you could add a tight end. I get that, and I understand how important, you know, obviously if Brock Bowers was still available there, that would be one that I would say in a heartbeat. But I want to go to the O-line. I think Cincinnati always embodies, for me, I always think legitimate O-line over the years, and Eric can have comments on that. I'm a J.C. Latham uh, fan from Alabama. I like what he is. Obviously a big man, big athlete, uh, can grow and, and, and mature comes from a program as we know. And I just think he would be a really nice fit there to continue to build around uh, for years to come. Yeah. It's, and the beauty is he can play guard. I think while, while you have Trent Brown out there, 
Um, but Trent Brown's not a long-term solution for them. So I, I really like that. Uh, I even think, you know, if, if JC Latham has a, you know, pro bowl type of season as a guard, as a rookie, you might just keep him there um, and be happy with it. So um, I, I like the pick uh, and that puts me up at 19, right? I'm going to, I'm going to stop the Brock Bowers slide <laughs> here. Um, him and that madness. offense. Oh my God. We didn't, my two we favorite. didn't pick him. You still screwed me up. Did I not pick Brock Bowers again? <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, he so was sorry. there. Do you want to? Got, you got, like, look, you got a good offensive lineman, Thomas. You're still good. Let me stay there. I am just, you got me, you know, Eric, you got me. I know. It's my around. fault. It's, it's totally my fault. I, I, take, I need to I recover. I'm lane. sorry. I won't go back to that. Sorry, Marcus. <laughs> I'm sitting there telling. No problem. Was available uh, as, the, <laughs> as the Rams, I'm, I'm not going to. Um, you know, ask for forgiveness on that. I, I will take Brock Bowers here at 19, which I still, I still do not think this is like unbelievably crazy that Brock Bowers could slide just because he is an undersized tight end prospect. It, when you hand that card in, I think you're, you're gritting your teeth a little bit. Like, is this going to return the value that we're hoping for, for our football team? So I still don't think it's insane, um, but getting past the, the Rams at 19, I think would be a little crazy. Uh, they did sign my guy, Colby Parkinson from Seattle was excited for him to maybe get an opportunity there, but he's not going to stop you from taking Brock Bowers, who, man, within that offense now with Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup, Tutu Atwell's turned into a good player for them. That's that's a really, really complex group of playmakers to try and stop um, and a perfect fit within their offense, too, the way they can uh, just kind of get them going on crossers and, and set them up for run after catch success, which is his best trait. This, yes, I agree. I um I think that the Rams are setting up Stafford to have success again. And, and they, and they've done a phenomenal job of doing that since they traded for him. Um, the Steelers, Matt, last year, their running game for the first three fourths of the year was really, really awful. And then down <laughs> the stretch, once, once they changed offensive coordinators for whatever, how, I don't know how it happened. But they started road grading on the offensive line. And Najee Harris, the last three games of the se regular season, when they went 3-0, and of course, 4.1 yards a carry, 78 yards. 4.5 yards a carry, 122 yards. 4.3 yards a carry, 112 yards. I may or may not have won fantasy football because of this. <laughs> now, I think with, with they bring in Arthur Smith, formerly the Falcons head coach, who's always engineered good offense as a coordinator. I want the Steelers to go back to the Dermonte Dawson to the you know the the offensive linemen they used to have in the past, right? I want that. I want the the physicality there um, uh, behind a Russell Wilson slash Justin Fields. So I'm gonna go uh, with Talise Wega, the the uh, Go Beeves, uh, Oregon State out of out of Corvallis there, uh, the the tackle there. Love it. Great reach blocker too. Like, yeah, you don't uh, think of uh, him as like the most incredible athlete, but when he gets out of his stance, he he seals that edge like brilliantly. I, Thomas, Thomas, a huge fan of scouting West West Coast players, so I, I I figured I would I would pluck a player that uh, from the region that he used to cut his teeth in there. There you, you go. Did, you did pluck a player. It was my. It was going to be my pick because he is such a hard nosed dude, right? I love the way he's playing, and um, so I, I like where you're going with that. My, you know, the needs for the Dolphins, of course, you know, I think that offensive line, they need to continue to build that. And um, I, I would probably have to say that you, depending on where he is, I mean, I, I, I need to probably dig into this. You took the Graham Barton early. You know, we're looking at mm -hmm. we're looking at a guy like Jackson Powers Johnson, you know, who's an yep. interior lineman, more of a center. Is he the type of guy that they need here? I'm usually not a huge fan of going that early unless they're really, really outstanding players. Um, you know, but that's where I'll go with this. Um, interior O line. Um, okay. You would, you would go with him over uh, Fatanu. I just wanted to double check with, with. Uh... Yeah. I just, oh, I'm sorry. Fatanu, is that what you said? Fatanu. Just... Yeah. Yeah, Troy fought on uh, You know what? You, why? Why are you talking me out of that? But maybe, maybe you're right. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to look here. I yes. I just was thinking 
Fatanu is is a guy that is is very high on the board let's, right now. So I just want to make Fatanu. sure. I like that one, Marcus. I think his, no, you corrected me on it. I was. I think, I think Eric. Eric put me on a spot where I was like, "Oh my God, that's the guy I wanted." So I, I didn't recover well. If this yeah. was a draft room, I would have showed my <laughs> shown my stripes here, Eric. That wouldn't have been good. Well, you said you didn't like taking a center so early, so I thought I'd maybe float that name yes. out to you because I think Fatanu has a lot of flexibility, and um, you know they're going to have tackle issues staring him down the board too. So he can kind of well, um, play wherever. Go ahead, Eric. Oh, well, you're just seeing like the you're seeing in the flesh how you know, we create content together, right? I literally, literally live up to my last name. Uh, and I was too <laughs> eager to, to pick well, when, when the time came and then, and now Thomas has been, you know, uh, you know, rallying sense, but that was a good pick Thomas. I thought that the, the dolphins, if they're not going to pick a quarterback there, right. Which they should also be thinking of quarterback. Uh, they should, they should try to protect the one that they got. Yeah. I may move. I'm glad Marcus you said that. From... <laughs> Sorry. I'm talking a lot today. I was going to say I may move Marcus uh, from being the uh, unbelievable um, podcaster, radio person that he is to what uh, as the assistant GM, because that was a great Ooh. pick to help me out of a bind. You were in my ear and that's all I needed instead of me making a bad pick at a center. So thank you. I'll that's, stop there. That's a huge compliment. Thank you. Um, I accept the position. Um, so, I, I do want to say, Eric, you brought up picking a quarterback there. I did that in one of my mock drafts back when J.J. McCarthy wasn't this top 10 guy all, uh, at the point in time. Dolphins fans, obviously not a fan, but, no. man, the idea of paying Tua Tungavaloa $55 million for me, um, let alone the, the injury history he has, but the just caliber quarterback he is, they've already run into cap problems. I mean, if that is me in the in the Dolphins chair, I don't know if Michael Penix is the guy that I'm I'm – pulling the trigger on doing that for, but it's certainly something I'm thinking about. Um, I just think you're really capped and, and setting yourself up for a rough, rough situation there. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, that would put me up with the Eagles at 22, I believe. Um, I mean, you, you've got several good corner options available. I think Cooper DeGene on that Eagles team is, is the pick. Um, you know, they still have their their veterans on the outside at corner for now. Uh, both uh, Bradbury and Slay showed some pretty serious signs of regression last year. I love Cooper DeGene as a star um, position slot corner in a Vic Fangio-style defense, just as he's used Jalen Ramsey in the past. And, uh, you know, I, I think he'll play that and then in time can step out and play outside as well. Yeah, and Gardner Johnson – just has a three-year deal um and they're not they're not strong at safety they're not strong at linebacker and really never have been so like there's a lot of things that they could do with him if he's not an outside corner and so you know i yeah. think teams like the eagles do a pretty good job of kind of being able to win multiple ways uh which i like yeah fangio's a coach that'll make sure he's in the right spot for sure so okay. do we want to have a conversation about what we want to do here because this was Eric's pick at 23. Um, no, we're good. We, we, we kept things the same. Just ignore me. We're going to keep the order the same. So go ahead, Eric at 23. Okay. So the thing that, the thing that really screwed up the Brandon Staley era was not the fourth downs. It was not being able to stop the run and they were mm -hmm. just gooey in the middle and you know they that he was so good as the LA Rams coordinator because he had Aaron Donald, Sean Robinson, and the guys that could really hold the point of attack. Jerry Newton is the pick here for the Chargers. He needs to be the guy that's like the the hold the point of attack player down there. I think if the Chargers come out of this with two defensive linemen from the Vikings picks, that's the start of the Harbaugh era. I think it's a pretty good start. Man, that pass rush is looking nice, and you know. Latu is a guy you can line up over the guard in the center as a stand-up rusher as well. He did that a lot. Um, you got Thule, you got Mack, you got Bosa who can slide inside. They're going to be moving these guys around getting after the quarterback, so that's that's going to be nasty. Um, all right, Dallas Cowboys. Thomas, you are up. So my guy's no longer there as a defensive coordinator. He's now the head coach up in Washington, of course. He's loving being up there and – the defense, I think that the defense continues to need to be built there, even though the O-line and the running back situation is precarious. 
I'm, I'm a little bit feeling like I'm worn out on some of our O-line run here. So I don't want to reach on that. I know how important uh, this, this offense needs to be here. And yet mm -hmm. I would love to see a, another corner there and overtaking a receiver there. I am thinking about um, honing in on one of the corners, one of the good corners left. I think Nate Wiggins is a heck of a corner. I think he can fly as long as they get um, their hands around some of the um, personality elements of him. Maybe uh, I think he would be a really good fit there as a corner. So I'm going to go with corner with, with uh, Dallas for Dallas. Am I, am I throwing you off? Am I throwing your draft off with that? No, I don't think so. I mean, they have two corners that I really like, but you know, um, I think the bland is going to be coming up on a contract soon. He's played a lot of slot as well. So you can definitely stick Wiggins outside um, and I mean, he's a special athlete, man. The, when I had watched his film, I was like the way he just gets in and out of his transitions, the, the stop start ability out in space was crazy. And then he goes out and runs a four, two, eight 40. And you're like, wow. So the long speed is there on top of the movement skills. It's a, it's a little bit of like durability questions with him, but I mean, sure. he's certainly going to be one of the best players on the board at that point. So I can't really argue with you taking that over a center or a guard from a position value standpoint. And, and Marcus, we've had experience with guys like that that come in, they're real light in the butt guys. And once they really start focusing, getting they're in a he's in a great program there, of course, but they mature mm -hmm. a little bit, they start eating more regularly. I think it's important. And I think he's a guy again. I know Dallas it would be nice to have a running back, et cetera, et cetera. To me, there are no running backs to even reach into the first round with, although there's some good football players. And I just like where 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 we're going with Dallas as a corner uh, pick. I think he turns 21 in December, so he is very much still maturing physically. So um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of his game. So I get to pick for my Green Bay Packers. And usually I'm looking at either Cooper DeGene or Graham Barton are like the two guys that are typically available here um, that I typically pick for them. With the way the board has fallen, honestly – I mean, Jackson Powers Johnson would be in play for me. Interior offensive lines in need, but these two, I really like these two wide receivers. I'm just debating if the playing time opportunity is going to be there for you. I, I will say this. I think you have to have a real internal uh, research on Christian Watson and his hamstring, and can you trust that he's going to be able to stay on the field for you because – He's the vertical threat in that offense. He opens everything up. Um, the on-off splits with him are are astronomical. So if you trust that he can stay healthy, you can go in a different direction. If you don't, I would absolutely take Brian Thomas Jr. He is literally my pro comp is Christian Watson in that role. So I'm going to trust Christian Watson <laughs> after all that. I'm going to trust that he can stay healthy. I think he's a good football player. Um, and I'm going to take Jackson Powers Johnson. Wow. Uh, you got Josh Myers coming up on the last year of his deal. Uh, I believe Powers Johnson has played some guard. Uh, so you can you can find a spot for him in year one, and then uh, probably is going to be your long-term center, eventually letting Myers go there at 25. All right. I got Tampa Bay at 26. I'm taking the best player on the board, even though it's not a need for Tampa. I'm going to support Thomas's favorite quarterback, Baker Mayfield. I'm going to take Brian Thomas Jr., who's the best player on the board right now. I, I think you can argue that it isn't a need when, when you get to the Bucks there because Chris Godwin and Mike Evans aren't going to be around forever, um, and they're going to want three wide receivers out there anyway. So I, I think you could certainly plug them right in. Uh, all right, Thomas, you're up. 27. Okay. It has the me Cardinals. here at 28. I am Cardinals, right? Oh, yeah, okay. did we? Is that correct? Um, no. Whatever. I... I've got 27. Okay. Okay. Thomas, you have Buffalo uh, at 28. Yep. You've got Buffalo okay. at 28. Okay. So I will pick again for 20 uh, at 27 for Arizona. This is a very easy pick. Jared Verse uh, kind of slipped into you a little bit at this point at 27. They need help in that edge room, and he's going to get after it right away. And Marcus, you know, the, the talk on him, as you know, he's strong and powerful and, and a heck of a competitor, et cetera. He's not the smoothest. He's not the most, you know, you're not watching him going, look at the, the fluidity of this guy turning and bending and exploding. That's mm -hmm. not him. And you're right. It would be surprising if he fell this far, but, but there's, there is a good chance. I like where you're going with that. Yeah. 
All right. So now you are the Bills at 28. Who Bills did not make a Julio Jones trade up to six in this mock draft. <laughs> you know, I, I really do think that they, you know, this whole idea of the Bills and receiver continues to, to tweak my mind. I, I, I love Brandon Bean as a, as a, as a general manager. Um, and I love the combination of the, the GM and the head coach there and know, know what they want, continue to build around a fantastic quarterback. I have to go with uh, Adonai Mitchell, as, as uh, Eric and I call him. So I think he's, again, the, the package of being a receiver around a guy that I have a ton of respect for and the head coach at Texas as well. So I think this is a good pick for Buffalo at, uh, what, what are we picking, 28? I like it. 28, yeah. yeah. And I, I know the Chiefs fan in, in Eric is probably really upset about that, unless you're not a big Mitchell guy. But Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. It, it's it's they, There's a lot of receivers here. Um, now, for the restored roar, Thomas's first mm. full-time job in the NFL, if I'm not mistaken, the Detroit Lions, as a, as a scout for Bobby Ross uh, in the late 90s. Uh, I'm going to go with the Detroit Lions. The Detroit Lions – Made the NFC Championship game last year despite not hitting on any defensive players in free agency. Uh, a feat in and of itself. They will hit on a defensive player here. They will be drinking the Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid McKinstry with 29th pick, cornerback Alabama. Love it. Such a good fit for their, you know, physical press man. Right up right up their alley. Um, so oh. this is me at 30, correct? Yes. yes. I am going to go... I'm definitely looking at the O line, but we've had that run. What was the number, Eric? Nine, nine and a half. Yeah, nine and a half. For, yep. And we've had. Am I going to be the one that sets it over? We've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've only oh eight with all there. So we still got some work to do if we're going to set it over. You know, Guyton. I think is is very raw. Uh. You wouldn't have to play right away necessarily, but is that how I want to spend my first round pick? Probably not. I know they have been tied to Jordan Morgan, who can play tackle, can play guard. I think if it's them picking, I think that's the direction they would go. Not an interior guy I love here. I'm not the biggest fan of Zach Frazier's traits to be a first round pick. Tough dude, smart player, but... I'm just neither of those old line picks I'm stoked about when I when I turn that pick in. The board definitely did not fall well for them. Cornerback. Again, it's tough. I, I think you're probably just taking Jordan Morgan, eating your medicine a little bit, making sure that offensive line doesn't get back to what it was a couple years ago when Lamar was out there running for his life. Uh, you know, they they lost um, Morgan Moses in in that trade so probably going to be your day one starting right tackle there in jordan morgan wow very good i like i like that um i got san francisco and then thomas has the has the chiefs i hmm, let's look at interior line Let, let's try to tip the scales here they do need interior they have one good offensive lineman on their whole team the problem is that you're not getting a value with any of these players. I do think this drops off a little bit. Uh, I would I will consider... say Christian Haynes is – I would not be surprised if they took him because of what he's so good at with the reach blocking and yeah. inside that system. They could weaponize him, but it is early for, for him. Yeah, it's – um they would tr I would trade back to if in some ways, but I just don't mm -hmm. know. I don't want to – I know we got to run here in a little bit. So um let's just go – let's just look at the whole board here. Um, I'm going to go with Georgia wide receiver Lad McConkey. They, they eventually have to consider Brandon Ayuk's contract. They have to, they have, they came into the offseason with five non quarterbacks making $20 million or more. They got to get younger. They're going to eventually have to pay Brock Purdy. Let's recycle. Let's re rejuvenize this thing. Let's take the best player on the board, in my opinion, at the wide receiver position. I really like that. I really do. Okay, Thomas, you're going to wow. send us home here. Wow. So I would say right now the the Chiefs room, draft room, is cheering before they even make the pick. This is what normally happens. The fact that you <laughs> went with Ladd, and I love Ladd. I love Ladd McConkey. However, I think to 
sort of restore this outrageous speed. You know where I'm going, another Steve Sarkeesian product. And I think they snap off the board very quickly. Xavier Worthy, from University of Texas, given, given this outrageous speed to replace your buddy, who ended up going to the Dolphins? How many years ago was that when you lost that? Two years, two Super Bowls. Two years, two years, yeah. two yep. Super Bowls. <laughs> so I, I like, yeah, where, I like where they all be able to do that. I've, I've seen that in mock drafts before, and had Chiefs fans comment saying, "Well, they just signed Marquise Brown. Why would you do that? Marquise Brown might go for fourteen hundred yards, ten touchdowns, and get a massive contract from someone else after this year. Um, so Worthy will play this year, but." it gives you long-term insurance there for someone that you might not be able to pay after you just gave Chris Jones $34 million. So I, I like that pick a lot. All right, guys, there is the mock draft. Um, thank you so much for coming on for year two. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you guys got going on um, draft day and, and over at Sumer. Yeah, for sure. Thursday night uh, on the Sumer sports YouTube channel, uh, Thomas and I will be starting a half hour before the draft. We're going to talk about kind of what a general manager like Thomas Dimitrov is going through before the draft. And then we were going to do a live look in, uh, for the whole first round and, and pick by pick analysis. We have some really cool voiceovers by some scouts in our, in our scouting department. We have some interviews, uh, one interview with an NFL player, one interview with an NFL agent. Uh, we have some live look-ins from actual the draft in Detroit. It'll be awesome. And then on Saturday morning, Thomas and I actually have a live hour on Sirius XM previewing day three of the draft. It'll be really, really fun. Thomas and I uh, have been preparing for this, obviously, by 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 hosting the SiriusXM show. I'm really excited. Su uh, YouTube.com backslash Sumer Sports. Uh, if you want to watch that that draft show live, it'll be our second time doing the, the draft show uh, live from our offices here in Atlanta. Awesome. Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you for the next video. Peace out.